Hey everybody, welcome back once again to the Dancing Sober Podcast. I really appreciate you coming in and checking in on us every week. Please take the time to subscribe to this channel. It is really important for the sustainability that we reach a thousand subscribers so that we can start monetizing um, on YouTube. So if you're on YouTube, please hit that red button where it says subscribe. I want to thank our sponsor, Movita Juice Bar, who's been with us from day one. Go to movitajuicebar.com or look for them on your food ordering apps. Shout out to Outer Circle Media, our little home right here on the west side. And this week on the Small Business Shout Out, we would like to highlight our friends at Monforte Studio. Monforte Studio is a QWOC owned studio that advocates through design. Go to monforte.studio to see what they're all about. And today, I keep, you know, wondering who I'm going to get next on the podcast. And I'm really lucky to have people like this person agree to come on here and um, open up their heart, open up their thoughts, and share with us their process. Today's guest is Rafa Esparza. Let's get into it. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome back to the studio here on the west side. And our guest today is none other than the big bad Rafa Esparza. My tocayo. <laughs> What's up, tocayo? <laughs> What's up, tocayo? <laughs> it's so funny because uh, I remember that in the beginning, um, I started sharing my number with people. And when I started to like get known a little bit in the, in the circle, um, some people would text me messages for you. Oh my God! Really? <laughs> I never knew that. Yeah, and they would not, but I would let you know. Okay. Remember I told you I was like, one oh, you told me I did. I remember that. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't know it happened frequently. Yeah, and then uh, also uh, one time Alan Nakagawa mailed me something, <laughs> and it was my address, but it was your name. Oh <laughs> so I said, Alan, is this uh, is this for me? <laughs> for Rafa? He's like, oh shit, it's for Rafa. But keep it. <laughs> You're like, oh, keep great. it. <laughs> and I'm, I'll send him another one. I'm like, all right, cool, cool. Because he, amazing. he would normally, he sends out like his New Year's. And you thing. guys are like good pals. Yeah, we're yeah. good pals. So it was funny that, uh, yeah, I had gotten <laughs> text before, but that was the first time that I got. <laughs> uh, That's hilarious. Straight up mail. That's really funny. So, Rafa, tell us a little bit about where you grew up or where you were born. <clears throat> uh, Let's I was, just go I back. I was born in, I was born in unincorporated east pasadena <laughs> <laughs> east side. um i have to say it because it now it actually has like a little like a little sign on this little oh, yeah. like um island that divides rosemead boulevard from like its north and south sides it says east pasadena oh, shit. um but it's specific because it's unincorporated which means that we we get like sheriffs out there we don't mm. get pasadena pd mm. Both are fucked, but mm. sheriffs are always like a little bit more. You know, all of the, like the, all of the gangs are like, the sheriffs are the ones that are in all of those like crazy gangs. Um, yeah. But yeah, I grew up in, uh, in Pasadena. Um, my folks, uh, when they came to the U.S., um, my dad came to Tijuana, and I think only had like this phone number of like a tia like a second tia hmm. um, that he had never met before. Um, but his, my, my abuelita, his mom, had told him, just go and call her and she's going to take care of you. You know, like how we do. Yep. And, <laughs> We've and he seen did. that so many times. <laughs> he arrived to Tijuana. Yeah, exactly. It, exactly. Yeah. And she still does it every time. Like yeah, she yeah. did it last time that I went. Yeah, I know that. Um, but he went to Tijuana, called my tia Nedina, who is now passed. But um, I kind of like grew up with three grandmothers. It was like mm. my grandma from my mom's side, my abuelita Lupe, my tia Nedina, who was like a, you know, an abuela figure. And then my abuelita Luz. And she kind of like took them in. She had like a camper, like a, yeah, a camper. Like a, what do you call them? A trailer. A trailer? Yeah. Like a trailer, trailer in, yeah. her, in her backyard. And um, I remember like... Um, I remember one of the times that we crossed um, um, back into the States. So I was born in Pasadena, but my parents were um, 
weren't like residents until like the mid 80s. <clears throat> they went back and forth. So they would, but they will still go back and forth. But I remember once, like very this very specific memory of like um, coming crossing with like a like a family member, and then waiting f at the McDonald's mm -hmm. at that very iconic McDonald's <laughs> that everyone San Isidro, cites. Um, San Isidro, yeah. yeah. Um, waited for my mom um, and then my aunt, and then and then I just remember waking up like in the trailer. <laughs> 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 um, but so like yeah, I grew up with like. My cousins, when they came, so my parents' house was like, always had like people in and out, family members, friends of family, strangers at like. Like the landing. There, that was like the landing post yeah. for a lot of folks. Um, and yeah, my tia and I lived like a couple houses down from where my dad ended up like finding a house and, and renting for, him, for, his, for himself. The house that I grew up in that he ended up buying, him and my mom ended up buying. Um, and so now, like, my family lives there. My yeah. brother and his family lives there. Uh, but then my other tia that came, like, in 87, she moved up the street. <laughs> and so the block that I grew up in... Um, Had all family right there. It was all family. And it used to be, like, all, like, brown, like, Filipino and, like, Latino, mostly Mexican. Um, but there's a DMV. If you've been to like the DMV in Pasadena, like that's the block. That's like the little alley <laughs> that I grew up in <clears throat> next to the DMV. Um, but yeah, like my tia moved up the street, and then I had an, another uncle that lived like, like, literally two doors down, and we used to just like the DMV was our playground. Mm. <laughs> we played like we played hide and seek between everyone's houses. Um, did you go yeah. to school in, in Pasadena High School? I did. I didn't go to Pasadena High School. Again, because we're unincorporated, he's, yeah. he's Pasadena. <laughs> you couldn't like go to, even though it was closer. Wow. Like we were, we could have easily walked to PHS if we wanted to. Um, we had to go to Blair, which oh. is like across town. Like is where that the, the one that's right by the 110 where it ends? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, around yeah. the side right there. Yeah. It used to be a bomb shelter. Oh, shit. No yeah, way. I didn't yeah. know that. It had like a gnarly, like brutalist, um, like building. Um, Hmm. But yeah, I went to Blair, the school that no one wanted to go to <laughs> <laughs> out of middle school. Because if it, it was like it didn't have anything. We didn't have like a um our football team sucked. <laughs> like we didn't have like a marching band. Um it just like um and then it, and it, it was like um um largely like immigrant. So hmm. it was like brown and black, like very few like Asian and white. Um, students wow uh, so it's like where all the paisas went yeah <clears throat> that's a trip like where it is and like thinking of that you know like you don't consider that side of town having that many brown people but that's where they sent them all <laughs> totally 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 i know people think pasadena you think um the rose parade yeah, yeah. the rose bowl yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all that stuff um but you know every city if you know los angeles you know that every city has like well, except for maybe Beverly Hills. <laughs> there's some paisas, there's <laughs> yeah. some paisas working there. But. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so after um, Blair, did you go straight to ELAC? So I applied to many schools because I was like, um, I was really lucky. I, I was like um, recruited into like this pilot program called Puente. Mm. Kind of like. The bridge um, program. Yeah. yeah, like a, yeah. yeah, where they kind of like encourage like this focused group of brown kids to like go to school after mm -hmm. school right mm -hmm. and so um they took us to like all of these like cal states and ucs and applied to cal state northridge that's where like my heart was set on i wanted mm -hmm. to go there and i didn't mm -hmm. get in because <laughs> i had really i didn't have bad grades but i was like average c yeah. student um and i remember like thinking well i still have to go to school i have to go to college mm -hmm. like I had already kind of, I, it was ingrained like in me that like I had to find a way to like pursue a career mm -hmm. through this like academic pipeline, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I went, I remember going to PCC and waiting in line to like register or enroll 
And then I just started seeing like a bunch of people from high school, and I was like, "Fuck, this is a drag. I don't want to. I don't want to like be stuck with the same people." That's hilarious, because it is like that. It's so especially like the that. first year. It's like yeah. so much like an extension of high school. It's the same thing. And um, my ex sister in law, Liz. Shout out to Liz. I remember she telling me about um this animation program that was opening up at ELAC. Mm. And I was like, damn, that sounds pretty cool. Mm. And I got out of line and I and then I just straight like drove straight to ELAC. And, wow. and um yeah, went into the admissions office. I didn't know like what the fuck I was gonna study or anything. Mm. Can I cuss? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about anything. Um doesn't and, casa. Yeah, like I just yeah. felt like immediately at home. That's another thing that I was starting to notice, like how like because I had visited like all of these schools, I remember having many conversations with people about like the culture clash cuz you know, they would invite us to have conversation with like um like students of color at these various campuses. Mm. And a lot of them would talk about like this culture clash and how like traumatic that was for them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, if I'm gonna be in community college for a while, like what better place to like fucking have a college experience than with like a college that's predominantly like Asian and brown. Yeah. And yeah, it just felt like it immediately like felt good. Mm -hmm. And ended up staying like seven years. <laughs> <laughs> it must have felt really good because I was there for a hot minute. Yeah, I was there for a while too. And I, I in the theater department, they used to call me the ghost of the theater department. <laughs> lifers, we're lifers. I was there for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> they did. They actually had a uh, an award show one day. Like a, we made a mock award show, and they gave me the lifetime achievement award <laughs> That's in amazing. the theater department. That he like that was fucking hilarious. Well, that theater was iconic. Yeah, Legendary. it was. It was um, uh, Army barracks mm -hmm. turned into a theater. That whole side where where VPAM is now, mm -hmm. it was all barracks that were taken from like World War II or something like that and Whoa. turned into um, student. I didn't I mean, even know classrooms. About that. Yeah, that makes yeah. that's like. So our theater was like only like this tall, and so we had like difficulty hanging lights because um Whoa. we couldn't hang them high enough. You know. Whoa. But yeah. that puts like a <clears throat> whole other like history to like some of the cruising experiences that I had yeah. in like the restroom <laughs> in, in those oh, buildings. Shit. Oh, yeah. Um, but crazy. I didn't know that. Insane. Yeah. Well, um, well, speaking of cruising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When, when uh, I know that, and I'm, on, I'm asking this because I know that it was part of your journey. And like when you came out to your family, how did that like change? Because you were already, we kind of skipped a little, but you were already into art as you were growing up, right? I was. You're I like, was. I was interested in art and doing different art. Mm -hmm. Did um, did coming out help you just like go for anything? Like you know, no more fear, no more nothing, or I don't know. Maybe just tell us a little bit about the transition from before and sure. after. Sure, I was always into art. I remember distinctly being in kindergarten and my mom asking me like, "¿Qué quieres hacer?" Cuando estás grande. And I said, quiero ser artista. <laughs> <laughs> years later, like recently, like maybe within the last 10 years, she was like, ay, mijo, tú cuando me dijiste que querías ser artista, yo pensé que alguien como Juan Gabriel. Yeah, like cantante, <laughs> right? Cantante. And I was like, I was like, well, I'm kind of like Juan Gabriel. But <laughs> <laughs> In a way. Um, but, yeah, I think um, coming out, coincided with like a couple of changes that were kind of like already um, in the works. I think like I was in the midst of kind of like going through a, a few different transitions. Like mm -hmm. I had, again, I had been at ELAC for like a hot minute, took like <laughs> every life drawing class, every mm -hmm. Chicano like, <laughs> like studies <laughs> course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, I was like, uh, I was doing it slowly cause I, was, I had a full time job. Mm. I was working in like at a hardware store, did it for like 10 plus years. And I was kind of like struggling because I was having like this moment of having like stability, financial stability. I had like a mm. managerial post and Damn. I was like getting like some good money, some good <laughs> money, right? Yeah. And I was like, but I still had like this. When, uh, when 2000 a month was like, Exactly, Damn. I know, when it, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when you could like actually do something like yeah. pay your rent. Um, 
but I but I still had like this burning like passion for just being creative, you mm -hmm. know. And so at some point there was like a switch like in my head that was like, all right, you need to make a decision. Are is this going to be like are you just going to like keep climbing this like um this retail whatever jobs mm -hmm. whatever your options are like in this world? Or do you want to like get serious about art <clears throat> and education? Mm -hmm. And I like cut my hours back, um, and then I just like um, prepared myself to transfer out of school. And so when that was happening, I was also like, um, kind of like working on working on like some personal trauma mm. um, that was like guiding me towards like just being like more honest with myself and the people that I love. Um, and so that prompted me to invite like some friends, my family, and then slowly like my extended community into like, this is me, mm. like I'm gay. Mm. Um, but it was like very daunting like it was very scary at the time <laughs> this is like back in 2004 2005 and you know I was already in like in my early 20s like it was you know I'm a late bloomer I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come out like when I was in high school or anything yeah. um, but I remember like at the time like at ELAC I was like building like friendships and relationships and with with like community that was like organizing um initiating like um folks that were activists um but also i think a group of us that were kind of like uh relearning our personal history hmm. through like um like uh through ceremony hmm. through um rituals that were that are indigenous mm -hmm. you know um kind of like as an entry point to kind of like begin to really understand and kind of like decolonize like our sense of being in the world mm -hmm. and i think those spaces at the time just weren't like ready to embrace like um i don't know queerness mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. transness like um, what was the atmosphere back then not only in those communities but outside in the world was it because like um, i think i don't know if now it's easier but more people seem to be like embracing Does that yeah make sense? i think, think it was definitely i think like maybe coming out stories are less like um i don't know dramatic um nowadays nowadays yeah, yeah. i think then 100 <clears throat> percent. i mean i you know i was in it so i was like uh the fear of like when i wasn't out the fear of anyone finding out was like mm -hmm. informed every sense of like how i interacted with people like how i presented myself like we it dressed, informed yeah. so much of like i i was kind of like guided a lot by fear you know when you think about it mm -hmm. um and yeah i think it just wasn't like even like the even like the, the term queer it just wasn't so like prevalent and spoken um and constant like homophobic and transphobic jokes um within like circles that, that you I had was, to sit through yeah that i sat through yeah. you know and like in sacred spaces you know also mm. feeling like very like fuck should i you know like could i be here like am i supposed to be here so um when i started to like and i do it slowly like um came out to uh, um, a couple of my closest like girlfriends at the time and then to my little sister mm -hmm. she was my first family member that i came out to and then to like my biological family <clears throat> And then slowly, I think just like, it's really strange because I just experienced this like this winter when I visited my, my parents' hometown in Durango, Mexico. 
it felt like I was coming out again. Like coming mm. out is like this, you know, people will say like you it's like an ongoing kind mm -hmm. of like process, right? Um and it does for me anyway, it gets like it does get easier. Um, because you're just like more comfortable with who you are, right? You're more at home, like in your body over time. Um, but I remember um yeah, coming out to like my immediate family and then like the cousins and Tia's finding out. And at some point I remember telling my mom, <laughs> can you just tell my grandma? <laughs> can you tell like my whole family? Like, um, and inadvertently yeah, through delicate. chisme, it does happen, you know? So I'm like, she probably already did. Yeah. Um, but then I remember like the advent of Facebook and Facebook being like a place where I was like, um, oh, like it's kind of like, it just felt very, synchronous i guess just like very timely the way that like mm. things like um the way that i was kind of like inviting this new path for myself mm. i i felt like facebook is like a it's a platform where i could kind of like you do you kind of like create like your persona right mm -hmm. and i was like oh like i could just be who i am and it'll be cool mm -hmm. like i don't have to come out mm -hmm. right just it'll let just them be see me. it yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Um, but so I remember like art used to be painting and drawing used to be like these like forms of being able to kind of like process ideas, maybe some politics, um, and images that felt like empowering. And I was just kind of like, it felt very empty. I remember hmm. not being able to draw or paint. Hmm. Well, I was just kind of like disinterested. It wasn't <clears throat> satisfying your, I guess, y it wasn't fulfilling what you wanted from art or from the process. Totally. Yeah, so it just felt like an empty drawing maybe or something. Yeah, it just felt it? like um, there's nothing that I felt like that I could say through those like formats, right? Hmm. But I also remember taking like a a queer chicano course um i think sibyl vanegas like taught it um amazing art historian curator icon um <laughs> but i remember reading um ricardo bracho mm. his writing and it was like the first um like queer literature written by like a brown man, like a brown gay man. Mm. Um, and it just like floored me. Like mm. it, it opened up like a portal of like questions and like possibility. Um, and then I had also like, I think like maybe a lot of people that knew of Asco, knew of them through like rumors and these sort of like mythologies that existed about like the shit that they had done in East LA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because also then there wasn't like uh, this sort of uh, uh, like a heavy visual portfolio of or an archive mm -hmm. that was public uh, that kind of gave face to a lot of these stories that we learned of, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember learning about like, um, learning about Asco And I actually, like, one of my coworkers at this hardware store um, used to tell me, like, was, was friends with Gronk growing mm. up. He grew up, like, um, in the Estella Projects. Mm. Uh, and he would tell me, like, all of these stories that um, show me drawings. Uh, again, this is before I had taken this, this course, right? Mm. And so I had, like, this idea of performance art and, like, what it does to public space. Uh, but also it being like this mode of inquiry, like this way of like um, creating a presence hmm. that can be like a statement. But the, that there's also like this whole like creative interrogation that happens, right? Mm -hmm. When you're like performing. And so after I took that course and all of these like, all of this visual life comes to the surface. Um, my excitement about performance starts to kind of like be invigorated. Hmm. And I, by the time I do transfer out of East LA um, to UCLA, I kind of, I just leave painting and drawing behind. Hmm. And, 
you know, UCLA is like our program. Again, I did my undergrad there, um, not as an MFA student, but even as, as an undergrad, like they ask you to take um, beginning courses in every genre. So you're like, you become very like versatile in like um, working with different mediums, but also like um, um, really kind of like psych- uh, centering um, kind of like ideation, right? Or like a concept, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and then I I start to like perform. I start to perform as his way of um, interrogating like my relationship to space, mm-hmm. like my relationship to my family, my community, these people that I've now had like this new kind of like awkward, estranged relationship to. Um, I use performance to kind of like look for queerness in all of these like histories that I like had been studying for a few years Mm. through Chicano studies and through these like rituals and ceremonies that I was participating in. So it it seems like performance art like answered a question of like, this is how I can do it. But within that, you opened up a ton of questions Mm -hmm. of what you're going to do. <laughs> totally. And it, it kind of, I feel like performance art was like this. It became such a seminal kind of like um, um, art form that, yeah, kind of like opened up, widened this aperture of mm. like art making. Because before then, I think growing up, I think the artwork that I was looking at was like, my brother's like a sketchbook that had like just like a bunch of like sketches for his like graffiti and tagging mm. like the homies like murals that they would that they would paint like in alleyways and obviously all of like the murals like in East LA like mm. those were like very kind of like formative uh forms of of art um that that had informed my own sense of like culture and art making and so like performance just like exploded my mind it was just like fuck we could do everything we could do anything i'm gonna read a little bit here from a bio i found on you and i want you to kind of um break it down for us Mm -hmm. because you know bios and (laughs) artist statements have a lot of dope ass words so it says uh, rafa sparza is a multidisciplinary disciplinary artist whose work reveals his interest in history, personal narratives, and kinship, and his own relationship to colonization and the disrupted genealogies it produces. Multidisciplinary, meaning, like, I'm not necessarily, like, faithful to, like, a a genre or a type of, of art making that could be categorized like within a canon like Mm. that's painting Mm -hmm. that's photography Mm -hmm. like i like i like to move through all of those things and be all of those things simultaneously more fluid i guess yeah just be like more fluid um be like water (laughs) (laughs) exactly um yeah it's really it feels like very uh generative to kind of like move through art making without being pinned down to like um this is that's what's exciting to me yeah like i think um yeah, you can no shade much. on people that identify <laughs> as drawers and painters yeah, and of course you know not. like um it's it's what i find exciting about the process um interest in well real quick yeah. um, speaking of process like how do you know like oh this is gonna be a painting oh no this is gonna be like me like burying myself in the dirt (laughs) you know how do you make those choices they're very guttural figured they're very guttural they're like um and they have to be Mm -hmm. if you're gonna like ensconce yourself in concrete (laughs) you better be like 100 percent sure that that's like what you want to commit to doing (laughs) you know you can't be like i met you and be like oh actually no i want to like uh, this should be a drawing (laughs) (laughs) that's funny yeah, let's try styrofoam. Um, exactly. They're very, yeah, they're just very guttural and intuitive. And that's another really cool thing about, like, being able to have an idea 
and have all of these like uh, processes at your disposal, right? Mm. Um, you can make anything happen. <clears throat> um, relate you, like what does it say that like I'm uh, a, your interest in history and personal narratives and kinship. Yeah, history. I like to put I put those. I've had this like this there's been like a few things that have been added and taken away mm -hmm. but like the premise of my bio has kind of like been there since since i was a student at ucla like mm -hmm. over 10 years mm -hmm. and i haven't like a lot of artists like switch up their bio mm -hmm. um those painters and illustrators <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it just remains very true to mm -hmm. like what i'm interested in and they're like they're big questions right mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, I put those three words together because history is like, um, history is like a, um, like a site of, of, um, with so many like unknowns, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we should always like question history, yeah. though I think it becomes kind of like, fact mm -hmm. through through documentation through records however you d however the person that wrote it decides to connect the dots exactly because it's, it is connecting dots oh this went from here to there but to the left or to the right of that could be a completely different story right exactly mm -hmm. and i feel like uh you know if you grew up and you went to like a public school in the u.s like you got fed like a point of view right um and when I started to deconstruct a lot of that, a lot of that storytelling um, in college, um, I knew that I was like personally invested in these ways of like knowing the world and knowing myself. I knew that I had to put alongside history the way that the way that it, that we understand like that field of study, alongside like personal like experience or my personal history and kinship, right? Because to me. Um, the ways in which we build knowledge through like oral history is like the stuff that my parents tell me, the stuff that my mom tells me, the stuff that my grandparents tell me um, has as much value, if not more than like what's on mm -hmm. the record. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like um, it's what feels like a lot of the questions that I have. Right. Like this sort of overlap of what I like have experienced personally and knowing that like my experience is part of like a uh, a genealogy right and mm. what 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 this presence does to like a site like a public space right what mm. history does that place have and does my presence complicate it does it reaffirm it is it in conflict with it um and so those mm. three words become like really important to kind of like put in in the way that I, at the time, was describing my practice. And I think, you know, it still does ring true to, like, the work that I do. Mm -hmm, definitely. And then the last <coughs> part is um, <clears throat> um, his own relationship to colonization and the disrupted genealogies it produces. Um, so it's a beautifully written bio. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. I was like, damn, she had words, like, <laughs> back in <laughs> 2009, 2010. <coughs> um yeah, I you know, I think it was also written at a time where I was like I was understanding that like I mean, I had also already experienced like um just being like racially profiled mm. like everywhere anywhere like by police, Big, right? Tall, bald Mexican. Yeah. Bro, I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I literally you like You can't even walk anywhere sometimes. <laughs> literally like being pulled over, which I know a lot of people like while driving, right? Like a lot of people have had that experience mm -hmm. uh, for no reason. But then also just literally like walking home from work, right? Um, and so being, I feel like most marked by being a brown person, like mm -hmm. growing up in LA. Mm -hmm. um, but I think ha having the language to understand where that comes from um, and that being like, um, an effect of like colonization, right? Mm -hmm. And understanding that it's like part of so many symptoms and effects 
and traumas, right, um, that really um, inform, like, how, like, the culture that we live in. Mm -hmm. um, and so understanding that, like, I'm a byproduct of colonization, right, um, felt important to kind of, like, put in the, my bio because what I'm, what I'm trying to do when I'm looking for queer ancestors, when I'm like trying to like, um, you know, provide a new perspective on like a site through like a site specific performance, um, is that I'm also like trying to like deconstruct uh, these kind of like uh, colonial um, ghosts hmm. that um, have traumatized us, that continue to haunt us, and that are reified through a lot of like systems um mm -hmm. that govern our existence yeah um yeah damn you go deep bro <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's see here um let's go a little bit into um because you brought up osco already once but um i i wanted to um just try to find out um because what i always try to like gather from um the guests is like your process or how you got somewhere right so i know that osco was some of kind of influence as you were learning about performance art etc and also um i was wondering if guillermo gomez pena is also an influence and maybe how they both influence i think you've met him already right? did you work with mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, I, yeah i remember seeing that yeah so um those i don't know a lot of performance artists so you know those are the two that i know <laughs> So um, just a little bit about how having, <clears throat> how how was it to like have these presence of these people before you and how is it to have them as a reference or anything you can give us on that? I mean, we have to, we have to always like cite um, our influences, people that inspire us, people that literally pave the road for mm -hmm. us to like, step into this like weird space of being a performance artist um because actually when you look at it and you look at the canon and you look at what's in the books um until until recently like it's not like a bunch of brown kids from east la <laughs> you know it's very white um and so yeah it's important to like name that genealogy um because I literally like wouldn't be here. I'd be I don't know what I'd be making if mm -hmm. if if they hadn't already done it. Hardware store owner. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> but also like um and like Guillermo Gomez Peña, you know, and, and having like it's so wild, like how I mean, after like I get like goosebumps thinking about it. Mm. Like I remember, I remember sitting in the break room. I used to work at Orchard Supply Hardware in Pasadena, mm. um, and I remember sitting there with um, one of my coworkers, Ignacio, and he started. He would like notice just like the books that I would bring into the break room. Mm. Um, they were art books, and then he started to just slowly tell me about like this weird friend that mm. he had growing up as a teenager that used to like cross dress mm. that was like always doing like these like um he called them very punk kind of like performances mm. and um and then he started bringing these drawings that were like in like a big manila envelope <laughs> and it's amazing to think that like ignacio kept those drawings for such oh, a wow. long time um and that i got to see like gronk's work before i even got to see it like anywhere else yeah. and these were like he was like yeah he would just make these like sketches for me and then he would <laughs> sign them and i was like gronk what a weird name that's fucking cool <laughs> and fast forward to like 2007 um at east l.a college there's a first um juried um student art exhibition mm. that karen rap organized for the vincent price art museum which used to be exist in like these like bungalows low ceiling yeah, yeah. <laughs> spaces <laughs> um 
and also prior to that i think a lot of the art shows that would be put on on display at the museum were kind of like chosen by faculty so this was like mm. a big deal like gronk was a juror oh wow and um by then i i knew who he was and knew of osco but i i was i submitted like three paintings <clears throat> Um, and I was like, if he just picks one, <laughs> I'm good. And he did choose one. Um, and I remember like, like Manuel was there, like, every, mm -hmm. like, like all just all, everyone was super excited about the whole process. Mm -hmm. It was like the first time I think we had been kind of like introduced to this process of like, oh, this is how, this is one way that like to get to get your work seen like in this space. Um, but then Gronk also like chose like two or three artists to like award a prize. Hmm. Um, and I was one of those. And so like, like a presenter. Yeah. yeah. And he like, I don't remember what the amount of the check was, but I was like stoked cause I got to meet him. Um, and I remember he invited me to my studio shortly after to his studio. Um, and I remember going to a studio and just having coffee with him and him like, you know, Gronk is like one of the most like generous, like artists, like mm. he will like, he's also like an incredible teacher. Mm. Um, but I remember like him, like putting videos on and just like filling up my mind with like all of this information. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, like, damn, I want to do that. Hmm. I want, I want to just like exist in creativity. Like I hmm. want to arrive to a place where I could just like, just be creative like hmm. 24 seven, you know, that's what like, that's what my experience of like going to a studio was. Um, and you know, it was like the same thing with Guillermo, hmm. like, um, reading about like him putting himself in a cage with Coco Fusco <laughs> um, and creating like this um, fictional, like indigenous, like peoples hmm. um, to make themselves spectacles of like in like traditional art spaces hmm. that ended up touring like the world. Wow. And, and then having the opportunity to like crash like his senior seminar wow. as like, I don't know, a first year at UCLA <laughs> undergrad. <laughs> I remember I went to a seminar and I stayed afterward to like say hi to him and introduce myself. I was like, oh mm. my God, like you're such a, I'm sure he like, he's heard this like hundreds of times. Mm. And then he was like, Vato, you need to like come to my, like my senior like workshop. Yeah, Cause yeah. we don't have any Vatos, Locos <laughs> in the class. <laughs> and I was like, Orale. all right, I'm down. <laughs> Orale. <laughs> And I did, I went and I just fucking crashed his course wow. and um, got to work with him. Got to like, um, you know, study like some of his like Pocha Nostra, like um, performance mm. um, strategies. Um, the process, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like this, um, those moments of like are very humbling to me. And I like, I, like I, it like thinking back on them always is like a reminder of like how like my world is like a hundred times like better because of work that they've done and the way that they mm. like so generously like um just brought people like me into their spaces mm. and so like how do you like as an artist do the same for mm. the future like how do you leave like this caminito, how do you mm. widen it? You know, how do you leave it better? Mm. Um, Somebody it be told me three words once that I always remember, and like you're making me think of it right now. That's like, aspire to inspire. Mm -hmm. that is it? It's like, yeah, you just want to give back. Totally. All the time, yeah. Totally. I mean, generosity, honestly, is like completely like underrated mm. and not practiced enough. Mm. Like in these fields of making art, making movies, making music think a lot of people walk around with like um holding on to things like very tightly mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and thinking of like i don't know i think pro approach um moving through these spaces from us from a pace of from a from a place of like 
scarcity, you know, mm -hmm. which is like very, it's real, you know, because mm -hmm. this is like f where a lot of these like places we come from, right? Mm -hmm. Lacking, mm -hmm. lacking resources. But I think um, those have been like big lessons, like learning how to be generous, learning how to like share a space, um, have personally like directly like taught me like how other ways that like that we can move mm -hmm. move through this world yeah um i've i've seen you perform a few times actually only <laughs> once in person um i've seen your stuff on video of course but i want to go through some of your um, performances that i have here or some of your exhibits and maybe just tell us a little bit about this and um the one that i saw was um cumbre Oh, Look yeah. as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west, uh, mocha, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was an intense performance um, together with um, brown skin, brown skin Sebastian hazel. I knew it was a hazel. Hernandez. Hernandez. Sebastian yeah, yeah, Hernandez, yeah. yeah. Um, can you um, tell us a little bit about that performance and what it was? Sure. Um, I mean, you, you could see it on YouTube. So I won't describe it, um, but maybe it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of this in the performance. It was like, um, there's um, revisiting like a site of, like a personal site of migration. Um, when my dad first came into the States, he was a teenager and he came in through um through uh texas uh chihuahua through ojinaga and he cra and he crossed the rio grande um and he actually drowned mm. and his 55 year old uncle resuscitated him through cpr wow and so i found myself there when i um did a a project with baru marfa mm. marfa is kind of like the sister city of ojinaga okay and they took me to big bend <coughs> national park yeah. um exactly that's it so yeah i was gonna ask you about this one Nick. so it's like what's going on so they're they're <laughs> totally interrelated so like this ballroom marfa happened first and then um and then that performance happened after mm -hmm. um but there was like a um i visited the big Bend national park i remember people were telling me that like oh yeah you could like cross a river and touch mexico I mean, mm -hmm. back in the u.s really cool <laughs> <laughs> And so I was like, I want to do that. Uh, we went to the river, and I remember them telling me the name of the sister city, Ojinaga. And I was like, oh, I know that name from somewhere. I've heard it before. And I was like, not Ramon Ayala. It's somewhere else. Because <laughs> that's where he's from. Um, but There's a city called Ramon Ayala? No, Ojinaga. Oh, that's yeah. where he's from. Oh, okay. But I was like, I know, I know that place, but how do I know it? And I was like, whatever. I'll figure it out later. And I went into the water and it was so calm mm. and chill and beautiful. Mm. Uh, and then I remember coming back. I was traveling a lot to Texas and back home. And I remember in one of my visits home, I told my dad like, oh yeah, we were like in this part of the Rio Grande that's by Ojinaga. And his eyes just like widened and he was like, what? He was like, you got into the water? No, ese río está bien bravo. Pendejo, pa que se mete? <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like trying to describe to my dad like how different it was when I walked mm. in. And he just couldn't like, he couldn't believe it. Couldn't know? shake it. Yeah, he couldn't history, shake yeah. it. And I was like, fuck. Um, he's still like very like traumatized by it. Yeah. And so I, I remember going back to the river with my friend uh, Timo. Timo Fowler, um, he wanted to do some work about like crossing the river. So we go back, when we go back, like it's in the fall and the water is like, pff, hmm. like full on. Like I remember when I first wow. walked into it, like it was like ankle high, yeah. maybe knee high. When I stepped into it, it was like up to here. Damn. And I was like, <clears throat> I wanted to, I didn't know how big, how, I didn't know what the life of the river was gonna be like when I went back. But I remember wanting to kind of like, just kind of like 
float in the water mm. and take a picture and show my dad like see <laughs> it's beautiful like these landscapes get weaponized to yeah. traumatize us right mm. but the river is just like a river mm -hmm. you know it's just water and i ended up like i was like fuck i'm still gonna do it i know i can't float but I, i'm still gonna do it <laughs> and i tied myself to this rock oh, shit. and i like floated for like half a second before i went like under and then i just like propped myself wow. up and i was like fuck and i just got out of it i just got out of the river um but so the idea that idea of like the river is just a river and it's like um people that create like these ideas about division um that become institutionalized through um through the government through like surveilling like violent forces um those ideas were kind of like um married with conversations that i was having with mocha about a performance that i wanted to do mm -hmm. which initially was like to be dragged by a low rider car mm -hmm. from east l.a into downtown Damn. over one of the bridges Damn. and this was when was that like 2018 this 17 one? 18 oh this one was 19 2018 2018 oh. you know like context like conversations uh, a lot of activity against like gentrification mm -hmm. and i think um dbh has had like all of these art spaces shook mm -hmm. <laughs> right mm -hmm. <laughs> rightfully so mm -hmm. but i remember mocha saying like we feel very sensitive about like um of supporting a performance that's critical of a culture that feels like it's under fire right now mm. and i was like okay and, and they and they acknowledge like and we also haven't been like a good neighbor to east l.a mm. we haven't been actively like connecting at all and so i'm like okay you're not here for east l.a as a community mm. <laughs> you're not here for this artist's vision i found it super confusing wow and i was like um i'm gonna just fold this into the work i'm gonna fold this conversation into the work so i ended up doing like a like a writing um yeah, like this kind of like poem. informal essay that mm. talks through the ways in which like brown people black people people of color indigenous people are like um queer and trans people are like tokenized you mm. know by these by these places um and one of the ways in which they do is by kind of like having this sort of like um, um, having intentions to kind of like bridge to like our respective communities, right? Mm. And so this idea of like the artist as a bridge is something that I become like mm. just adamantly like critical of. And I was like, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> no, like this mm. isn't like... Number one, like I'm not an, ambas an ambassador for an entire like community. Mm -hmm. I'm not an ambassador. It's so like it's difficult to get put in that position. Totally, yeah. But so I end up like, I mean, and you could see it in the performance, like a very like a staple kind of like moment of the performance is I build an actual bridge that people have to walk over to get into the space, mm -hmm. and it's made out of adobe, and I'm like lying underneath it so people have to walk mm -hmm. over my body to get into <laughs> the space and there's like these like mylar mirrors. mirrors that people could kind of like see themselves walking into the space and maybe see my body underneath mm -hmm. um but that was kind of like the premise of that performance is like thinking of like how we're also just like water and we want to be mm -hmm. able to like move freely without um um unrestricted from like these violent forces that are like killing us mm -hmm. you know like um holding us captive mm. but also as like a creative like <clears throat> i want to be able to imagine and dream beyond like the confines of and the circumstances that i embody on a day-to-day mm -hmm. -day. like i want to be able to like dream something and just pursue it and just get out of my way <laughs> have you like that's really interesting because um 
just knowing that like you had some pushback so like has there been other times where you've had that kind of pushback oh absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah i think a lot of my work in museums whether it's like through performance or through adobe has evolved through like uh these conversations that i have with um with these spaces hmm. you know like the adobe work in particular has evolved like from um this object that i think embodies a lot of aspects of how i've experienced like navigating our world right hmm. um it being kind of like a marginalized into outdoor spaces or adjacent spaces not in the actual galleries hmm. um it's two initial um times that the adobe was um shown in museums at the hammer and then at the whitney mm. there was this conversation of like this fear of like dust going up into the vents mm. and you know although there's like there's like horse shit in it <laughs> there's fucking la river water in it <laughs> there's a lot of life in those other so, so the museums um like conservationists were like we can't have dust in here or yeah yeah. And so the work couldn't exist in the gallery, right? And so at the Hammer, I used like the outdoor space. Yeah. Right? And at the Whitney, it was like this lobby gallery, like on okay. the ground floor. Again, yeah. kind of like, you know, they're like, um, they are logistical kind of like maneuverings, mm -hmm. that decisions that they have to make in order to kind of like preserve, um, you know the safety of their artworks yeah uh but at the same time there are like historical social um implications right with like when you when you propose like let's spray these other way bricks with a pesticide right mm -hmm. or let's zap them with radiation you know i'm thinking back to like the bracero program mm -hmm. you know when mexicans were allowed into the u.s to make up for the labor shortage during world war ii right and then being sprayed down with the down. pesticide, right? Mm -hmm. There's like, there's like a, there's like a direct correlation between like this material that's land and a body that's brown. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like a lot of these, and that's very like, I feel for me, that's how I also understand like, um, kind of like contemporary art, mm -hmm. like, one of the aspects of contemporary art is being able to have like these conversations and then being able to kind of like be part of a process mm. um, or the life of a work. Um, I I wanted to go through all these, but I don't think we're gonna have time, but I do wanna ask you about um, the La Calle 2018 <laughs> that you did at, in the alleys downtown, in Los Callejones. Yeah. Um, I missed that day. I got the info. Luckily, I spread it to Mr. Elon Schoenholtz. Oh, dope. <laughs> <laughs> it took beautiful photos that love day. love Elon. But, man, he talks about that every time I see him. He just, he just like, was like, man, that thing was so beautiful. He loved being um, able to see that experience. And um, Elon's but, rad. Yeah, love tell Elon. us about that. Um, so the La Calle happens after having conversations with the ICA about um, this exhibition. Uh, that they invite me to in, to um, to do in their like kind of like project space gallery, hmm. um, and I remember they had kind of like um, described the space as like experimental, and you kind of like do whatever you want, hmm. um, and I remember like feeling like I'm always in my feelings, like especially when I'm doing performance. I'm always just like allowing like. A feeling to kind of inform like what what happens but i remember feeling like very like um nervous about like doing site-specific work because the conversations about space were so polarized at the time right and here is ica like the newest kind of like art institution that just opened up with mm -hmm. the proximity to, to skid row to boyle heights mm -hmm. but also to like the the historic fashion district which is a santi mm -hmm. alley right mm -hmm. Um, and I just, I was like, I've been wanting to do this project for a long time. I used to live like in, in downtown and I remember, you know, just like walking out, like walking outside 
on 7th Street onto Broadway and just seeing like all of all of the markets, all of the people that are vending, uh, many of them have since like disappeared. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's all of the life of of downtown. Um, and I remember thinking like, damn, this would be like the dopest, like immersive, like venue for a, a lot of friends that do performance in like nightclubs mm-hmm. that make fashion, that make objects that are related to the body. Um, but then as I started to think about like ICA as a potential site, I was like, I kind of brought that idea to them um, and I ended up using their gallery to create like a workroom. Mm. I brought in like work tables, a sewing machine, mm. a bunch of like glitter and yeah, <laughs> basically yeah. like um, stations where all of the artists and performers that I invited could use as their studio mm. to like make all of these looks that would be used for like an impromptu performance at the Santi Alley, mm. you know? And it was like very important to kind of like, uh, to invite people that have a relationship to Santi Alley. Some mm. people have actually vended there before, sold their stuff there, mm. literally buy stuff there to come up with their looks that they used to perform in, uh, just shop there, like on a regular, like the Santi Alley is a place where the knockoff thrives. Mm-hmm. Um, it's where you find all <laughs> of your you fake need fashion. For graduation. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and then down the street, there are like all of these palm dresses and quinceanera dresses. I think it's where the bacon wrap hot dog was born too. I, I don't think I saw it anywhere before that. Yo, <laughs> and the way that, the, the and the way that like those like chucheria stands have grown into like mm-hmm. legit restaurants now. <laughs> it's yeah. all so amazing. Yeah. But the premise was to like, uh, harness the resources that this institution has mm. and funnel it, um, redistribute it across like all of the people that I invited to work with, mm. right? To make art um, that doesn't have to like exist in a museum mm. that could actually like flourish and thrive in public space. And so um, that's what we did. Yeah. We kept it word of mouth. We didn't yeah. publicize it on, on their website or on any website. It was yeah. all just like, we didn't want to bring in like a white art audience into Santiali. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, like sitting like sitting very closely with the conversations around like gentrification and how as artists we um you know there are pitfalls to our processes and so like just being very like strategic about like how this could unravel. Mm-hmm. And so like um the majority, maybe the exception of one person, <laughs> were a trans queer identifying um, artist of color. Um, and it was beautiful. Yeah, I didn't do much but just like put on a hoodie with like a bunch of mechanical puppies mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that were barking. Um, but I just followed the procession and I got, I got a chance to like experience a performance like everyone else. So you reminded me right now of um, the backyard art exhibit. I forgot what you guys called that. Oh um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At Alfonso's house. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's another guy Amazing. killing it right now? Yeah. Um, but um, I remember that too was like kept like all right, this is friends invite only and stuff like that, and it wasn't like you know wasn't announced, it wasn't like you know publicized or anything like that. How how did that come about, and, and um, what do you think you learned from doing that little show? Um, I had met Alfonso um, maybe that same year that we did it, if not maybe just a year before, uh, and did a studio visit with him, and I just immediately like fell in love with, with what he does. Uh, but also like found his... I just was very like charmed by his backyard and it reminded Mm. me of like my parents' backyard and I was like, fuck. And the many times that I've worked in their backyard to make my own work happen. Mm. uh, And he, that was a studio. Um, And I remember thinking, well, just asking him like, fuck, have you ever done anything back here? And he was like, yeah, I have. And I was like, we should do like, we should do an art show. Uh, But before that, I was like, let's have a conversation about this space you know um and then just started inviting like all of these heads to like convene at his spot for like a carne asada Mm -hmm. and to have conversations about like 
what happens when our work is made in these spaces and then travel out to like like a gallery or museum and then gets to travel around the world like mm -hmm. um what are the possibilities of kind of like working in this backyard and that conversation was rad like we recorded it uh, we haven't really done much with the audio but um we had a couple of those gatherings that culminated with like an actual exhibit mm -hmm. that you were part of um and a lot of our peers were part of and i think the intention again was to kind of like i mean i i was like personally kind of like nerding out on just kind of like observing and having the experience of having like Mario Ayala's like <laughs> pimped out like fucking uh, barbecue grill, mm. like in an actual <laughs> backyard, you know, like, damn, this is, this yeah. belongs here. Yeah, yeah. All of our works belong there. You know, I was like, but there is an aesthetic and some politics that um, Mario Barra like spoke very beautifully to during mm. one of those conversations of like, um, that inform like our sense of moving through space, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think just having like a a space where we could that we could call our own, that we could talk about like in our own words, felt very vital and important. And I think the idea of like artists is like Los Angeles is like overrun with so many artists run spaces, but they're not run by us. Mm -hmm. You know, they're mm -hmm. run by like a lot of like white transplants. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so like. What about the backyard hmm. that's specific to like Los Angeles that that historically like is a place of like organizing, but also just like social like convening, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. why not harness these spaces as like our like mm -hmm. artist spaces? Right? <laughs> I mean, I, I was learning out. <laughs> nerding out myself at that event just being around like you know just everybody that i you know had been following and admiring and getting to meet people that i hadn't met before that were artists that i've been following too so it was definitely like a dope ass experience for me you know being invited to that little circle i mean i'm glad i feel i was just talking to um a friend that was like yo i actually met them at the backyard art show <laughs> Like literally, like that's where I met them, and we've like stayed in touch. Ever so. I think a lot of people, like a lot of people that have kind of like been admirers of each other's works, ended up meeting there. Like in this yeah. very in the in the most like chill. unstressful, mm -hmm. chill, yeah. laid back way, yeah. which is like what you want, like, right? You were both at the nachos table at the same time. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I want to um, just ask you one final question and that's a question that we ask all of our <laughs> guests uh -huh. um but first i want to say thank you for taking the time to come out here and be with us and struggle through traffic <laughs> um and i really appreciate you opening up today and sharing with us um your experience and uh, the question that we ask everybody at the end of every show is um a question that you can answer in any way you want but try to answer in one sentence okay there's a magic in everything that you do. <laughs> There's a magic in the things that you do and okay, how you okay. do them. And uh, the simple question is, Rafa Esparza, how do you do it? Okay. Um, before I answer that, I want to thank you for inviting me on um, and for doing all of the work that you do um, to not only, like, build, like, connections amongst, like, a lot of our peers, um, that maybe would be unknown mm. and and creating like a record like mm. an archive you know it's i think these like these moments are gonna like inform a future yeah, <clears throat> i hope so um and damn how do i do it <laughs> with um i think uh, um by relentlessly pursuing my right to dream. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Rafa. Um, really appreciate it. And unless there's anything else you want to say. When is this going to come out? Uh, <laughs> Friday morning. So <laughs> Friday morning? Yeah. I would love to shout out some art shows. Yeah, definitely. Because it was like 
some magical yeah, stuff definitely. out there happening. There's Alfonso Gonzalez Jr.'s mm-hmm. show that's at Matthew, Matthew Brown. Brown in the Mid Wilshire area off of La Brea. Right across the street from Pink's Hot Dogs. Exactly. <clears throat> in the same neighborhood, Gabriela Ruiz has is part of like a two person show. Um, look her up, follow her on Instagram. Um, La Pau Gallery has like these two sickening shows coming up. Mm. Um, one of them is like a an archive of the Cholombiano scene in Monterrey. Mm, that's awesome. Um, the artists can't be there, but the work will be there. And alongside um, the first, like. A uh, gallery show in the U.S. of Dorian Ulises Lopez Macias, who runs Mexicano MX. Wow. Um, what else? Um, that's it. <laughs> What's your website and your Instagram? I don't have a website, um, but I have my Instagram is El Rafa Esparza. El Rafa Esparza. And that being said, thank you and see you guys next week. <laughs>